Hello and welcome back. We have another special podcast for number 21 in honour of World Migratory Bird Day. As a social and economic development continues to grow across Africa, tensions have risen between utility companies and species conservation groups. In a considered effort to resolve these conflicts, Power Africa is now working in collaboration with BirdLife in order to inform its policies in alignment with the needs of migratory birds and other affected species. We cover a breadth of issues from a variety of perspectives and get into the practical solutions which can have a positive outcome for both human development and conservation. I learned a lot from this discussion and I hope you will too. If you like this episode or would like to follow more on this project, please follow the links in the description. And if you'd like to support us, you can make a donation at restoreplant.org or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Enjoy the conversation. Hello and welcome back to our Restoral Planet podcast. I'm joined today by BirdLife and Power Africa, who are going to tell us a little bit about their collaboration going forward, dealing with some socio-economic development issues and migratory birds. So to start with you, um, Alex, tell us a little bit about the Background Flyways program over at BirdLife. Yeah, thank you very much, Jack, for having me on the co- podcast. Um, I'll actually start by introducing BirdLife, which is my organization. And then I'll talk about the Flyways program. So. Uh, about BirdLife, BirdLife International is a uh, is the world largest nature conservation partnership with uh, 117 partners. Our purpose is to conserve global biodiversity, habitats, and birds. Working with people and business in the sustainable use of nature's resources, um, we inform um, and advance evidence based, you know, business policy and practice and we offer a wealth of proprietary data and tools. Uh, and we are actually present in a total of 115 countries. That is where we are having conservation action taking place. Now, going forward, um, in terms of the programs that uh, Bad Life is using to conserve nature, uh, we have quite a number. And one of the key um, uh, programs uh, which is at the center of uh, bird life's work is actually flyways and migratory birds program. And this is a program that um, looks at the issues that affects migratory birds. Migratory birds are unique because um, they are wide ranging. If you conserve um, habitats and sites uh, in one country, you need to go out and check where those migratory birds are going so that you also initiate interventions in those sites. So really, a flyways program is, is, is a very unique program. And what we are looking at is um, out of about 10,000 10, species of, of birds, about 17% of those species of birds are classified as a full, fully migratory. And uh, Broadly, you can actually classify um, the migratory species into three major groups. You have land birds, you have soaring birds, and you have water birds. So bird life and the, and the partnership attempts to look at those species, their sites and their corridors, their migratory corridors. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, over to you, Paul. Tell us a little bit about back, uh, Power Africa. Good, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Maina. Uh, I want to do a brief background about Power Africa. Power Africa is a US government led partnership that harnesses uh, the collective resources of over 170 public and private sector partners to double access to electricity in sub Saharan Africa. Uh, since 2013, uh, Power Africa supported projects have added nearly 12,500 megawatts of cleaner and more uh, reliable electricity and more than 27 million new power connections for home and businesses. To add on that, uh, Power Africa goal is to add at least 30,000 megawatts and 60 million connections by the year uh, 2030. 
Uh, implementation of Power Africa projects is done by different programs. Uh, we have East Africa Energy Program. Also, we have uh, Southern Africa Energy Program, West Africa Energy Program, and also uh, Nigerian Energy Program. Uh, just to mention, uh, each program has its own uh, objectives. Thank you. Thank you. And just quickly, Paul, is this all across uh, Africa? Yes, it's all across Africa. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. All right. So back to you, Alex. Tell us a little bit about some of the threats facing uh, migratory birds. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jack, again. Um, migratory birds, uh, just like uh, other uh, wildlife, are ex experiencing uh, different sorts of uh, uh, threats. And um, I would like to list some, some, some here and uh, which also relates to, to, to you know, energy sector development. So one of the threats that are, I mean, uh, that, that uh, migratory birds are facing is land use pressures. I mean, we have uh, land as a finite resource and we have a lot of competition uh, to use the available land resource uh, for activities like agriculture. Uh, we have, uh, we have to grow forest on the same land. Uh, we have to settle on the same land. We have to develop infrastructure on the same land. So, I mean, as human demands rise, as the population of the world rise, so we are experiencing this pressure. And therefore, the, the migratory birds, just like other wildlife, are caught in between. So the other one is uh, loss and degradation of special sites. Um, as you know, uh, some, uh, some migratory birds are quite specific. Um, you find uh, water birds, for example, using same points uh, when they are crossing continents to move from one place to another. Uh, so, for example, when you talk about agriculture or extraction of uh, resources from, from, from uh, wetland habitats, then you have some sort of negative impacts on those sites and that affects uh, migratory birds, for example. The other point is, um, you know, where birds are viewed as biological resources. So we are talking about people hunting uh, birds. And uh, when, it comes, when it becomes a conservation concern, is especially when big volumes of birds are being extracted from the world and when people are extracting, you know, um, globally threatened species, for example. So that is a big problem, as you will see later. Human disturbance is, is, is another problem. Um, and um, it also emanates from of activities like hunting um, of, of birds. And human disturbance is actually a very serious threat, especially to show birds and even water birds. A diseases and parasites is, a, is another threat. I think we've all heard about the bird flu um, and uh, which, which happens to kill uh, thousands of birds at, at one go. Um, we have uh, uh, para, I mean, uh, disease um, pathogens like uh, bacillus. Uh, you know, which causes problems to birds. Uh, of course, um, I would be unfair not to talk about climate change. Climate change is a global crisis. It is not only affecting, you know, humans, but also birds. I mean, when you have land pressures, when you have loss of, uh, uh, you know, or, uh, habitats for use by, by the birds, when there is hunting pressure, then you, you bring in the component of climate change, then things will be worse for, for, for migratory birds. Uh, so I want to list those as, as key issues that are affecting migratory birds. So um, my, my first point, which is about uh, land use pressures and which uh, also links very closely to the energy sector, um, is, 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 you know, development of infrastructure. You know, power generation, power transmission involves, you know, development of, you know, infrastructure. And um, 
you are looking at a situation where, uh, for example, you are building a power line across or near a very important site for migratory birds. So that creates um, um, uh, some problems to, to migratory birds, uh, especially if not done without any consideration to uh, birds' activities around. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Just one follow up question there. So, more specifically speaking, when these power lines, et cetera, are going up, how does it directly affect the birds? Does it kill them? Does it just get in the way? Does it confuse them? What happens yeah. with their uh, pathways? Yeah. Um, uh, we, we, I, I want to step a little bit back and say that um, depending on energy infrastructure, um, if, uh, the infrastructure affects uh, various types of birds. For example, uh, when you talk about big bodied birds, we are talking about a uh, 1.9 meter, you know, size of a vulture. So this is a big bodied bird. And when it is moving, you know, looking for food, um, usually the concentration is where to get food. And a lot of times when the infrastructure, for example, is not visible enough, it is impossible for the vulture to actually avoid it. So if there is a power line, which is, you know, not visible to, to the vulture, they will straight away come and collide with, with these birds. And, um, um, and, and for, for wind farms, for example, when the turbines are spinning with high speed, you, 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 you get a, a situation where it is, the, the, the turbine is not visible, it becomes blurred. So the, a bird which is chasing food or which is competing for food with other birds will not, you know, see these things. It's not keen to look at uh, any obstacles. It will fly into the turbine. It is chopped, it is flies into the power line. It is hit and it is injured, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it dies. So those are, that is one of the problems, collision. The other problem is actually electrocution. So we have two kinds of power lines. We have bird friendly power line and we have bird unfriendly power line. This, this, these designs are there. So what happens with the bird, I mean, a power line that has not been decided uh, properly without you know, consideration for birds, it is designed such that when a bird patches on the power line, when it is spreading or it is it is patching on the power line itself, it is actually electrocuted. So, and what happens with electrocution is, is very easy. One, you, you get um, an injured bird and most often the bird dies after electrocution. But more importantly, when uh, electrocution occurs, it means that there is power interruption in that in that uh, in whichever place the power power is supplied so birds are affected by mainly in those two forms of course the other one is um you have a big dam um it it affects uh, you know like uh, important feeding grounds for for migratory birds uh, the, the the nice habitats are submerged and they are no more so depending on which infrastructure, they affect the birds differently. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Some interesting insights there. That leads me on nicely to our next question. So Taryn, I'd like to bring you in on your perspective. What are some of the environmental challenges facing development of uh, power infrastructure across the continent? Hey, Taryn, I'm afraid we can't hear you. Sorry, just for everyone listening, we are sort of scattered about the, uh, the world. I'm in Europe, of course, and my guests are in, in Africa. Sorry, Terry, we still can't hear you, I'm afraid. Okay, um, I think this builds on very much what uh, Alex was saying earlier. It's just a continuation, basically, 
And some of the major challenges that we are finding in terms of the interaction between uh, energy and wildlife or energy and birds with regards to migration is obviously collisions with the lions. And uh, I would like to use a specific example such as flamingos. We have a problem because flamingos fly at night and they migrate from one area of Southern Africa to the other area in another area of Southern Africa. And actually sometimes flamingos fly from South Africa all the way to Madagascar. And they do this during night and the lines are not visible at night. So they pose quite a threat to, to themselves by flying at night. And so one of the mitigation actions that we're able to do is put lights or LEDs and a solar panel on top of a, a bird diverter and retrofit them onto lines. Ideally, that would be better if we put them on before we actually erected lines or erected lines outside of paths of where such as the flamingo would fly. So that would be some kinds of examples. Other issues we have is with roosting birds. When they migrate, um, they'll find a place to, to land and to spend the night, but not just in their normal behavior and habitat, we also have those problems. So that leads you very much towards the tower design. So the tower designs are not very bird friendly that we have in Africa at the moment. Um, we have Eskim in South Africa that has gone through a process where they have started changing their towers and their infrastructure to be more bird friendly. But um, largely in Southern Africa and Africa, we're dealing with infrastructure that is not very bird friendly. You know, the other thing that cottoned on to what Alex was saying in terms of habitat, for example, wetlands, you know, a bird flying into wants to come and drink water in a wetland or flies low over wetlands. And if you stand at the top or look from a bird's eye view down at power lines over a wetland, they actually disappear into the landscape. They really aren't seen. So we really need to put something, if we are putting lines over wetlands and watercourses, which is not ideal, but because we want to electrify the whole of Africa, because we have such a power shortage, you know, we, we've got to think about these things before we have to retrofit later on in terms of putting mechanisms in. So, so that's another place where we're seeing a massive environmental challenge with regards to energy and birds. And then the placements of lines, you know, we do environmental impact assessments or environmental and social impact assessments um, through before we develop. But the problem is most of these EIAs or ESIAs have been um, done with little insight into avifauna because we've got poor avifauna data across Africa. So from a desktop level, it's very difficult for um, a specialist to go and find out exactly where the bird paths are. The data is still being developed. And then, you know, we have people that don't see avifauna or birds as important when, they, when they're doing an ESIA or ESMP on, on um, as important when you're talking about energy, which is some of the fatal flaws that we're seeing as energy gets developed in, in the sector. And then, then the last one I would say is, yes, renewable energy in terms of uh, wind turbines are significantly damaging to birds. However, for me, what the greatest impact is, is we're building these wind farms all next to each other and we're causing these massive clusters of wind farms. And your local birds will learn to fly around the area where the turbines are, which puts pressure on the peripheries and creates an ecological vacuum that can cause species to go extinct. However, the other issue with migratory birds is they don't know that those renewable energy farms are there and they fly directly into it and you can kill a stack of birds in doing that. So all of these are major environmental factors that we're dealing with when we, we're deciding to power up Africa and what we've experienced in Southern Africa and probably West, East and the area that we've worked in. So, so those are where the key environmental challenges I would say would be. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Alex, back to you. Um, 
So obviously there's, we're talking about two almost conflicting things here. We're talking about sort of obviously Power Africa and, and socio-economic development, lifting people out of poverty and these things. Does it necessarily have to come at the cost of the species? And are there reasons why, in fact, uh, it's actually beneficial to keep these, these migratory birds alive? And how does that tie into bird life's work and initiatives? Yeah, thank you, Jack. I mean, uh, uh, obviously, um, people, uh, uh, people in Africa needs uh, uh, needs power. They need electricity uh, to grow new opportunities, socioeconomic opportunities, and um, there is no way we will say power is not important. Um, at the same time, there is no way we will say. We, we, we develop the power sector or the energy sector uh, without considering the negative, the possible negative impacts that uh, there could be. So uh, what Bad Life has been doing is um, really to have an integrated approach. Yes, we need power, uh, but at the same time, we need uh, you know, a, a power sector that realizes that we have nature that we need to conserve, that nature that we need to, to, to manage. So uh, going forward and uh, uh, bad life realizing this, um, this unique situation, uh, as, as part of the Flyways program, we have prioritized energy sector as a key thematic area for intervention. And um, uh, what Bad Life has been doing is uh, really developing some innovative tools. For example, the sensitivity mapping tool um, is a tool which enables the developers, the policymakers, the planners to very much in, in advance to identify areas that are potentially uh, could, uh, could, um, could bring conflict when energy infrastructure is, is developed. So at a very early stage, um, people, the, the developers, the planners are able to know if I did a weed farm in a certain area, I'm likely to you know, face less conflicts than if I put it in a, in a different area. And, and this comes, uh, and this helps also with, with, with cost. So if you are if you're, if you're establishing your wind farm in a potentially high conflict area, your mitigation measures, your biodiversity safeguards in that project is likely to be high compared to a, a site where there is low likelihood of having conflicts with, with birds. Uh, the other, the other uh, point is that um, as, as Taryn said, um, the existing infrastructure, especially power lines uh, in Africa, is actually designed in a friendly way. So what do we do? Because it, 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 it has killed, it, it kills bad as long as it existed, you know? And some power lines are really old, constructed in, in 1950s, and they are done without considering birds. So they continue killing birds up to date. So what bird life has been doing is um, uh, we've been working with, uh, with, with especially the utilities, uh, posing the question, where do we have, um, you know, the hotspots? Where do we have a, a lot of conflicts, a lot of collisions, a lot of electrocutions of birds in your grid system? So with that information, we're able to map the hotspot areas, and therefore prioritize those ones for intervention. So, and there are many ways to, to intervene. As Karen said, there is a retrofitting. You can either uh, put, you know, gadgets on power lines to make them more visible, whether it is during the day or during the night, such that when birds see them, they see an obstacle, not necessarily the power line, but the obstacle, and they are able to you know, digress. They're able to avoid that kind of uh, that kind of an obstacle, which is deadly. In terms of wind turbines, um, 
a bad life uh, up to now as as partnered with um, some developers especially in the northeast africa uh to develop uh, what we call a you know shutdown or demand and uh, this protocol is where there is a coordination within the wind farm management uh, to shut down the entire wind farm or specific wind turbines such that uh, collisions with migrating birds are avoided. And uh, from our assessments, from our analysis, the shutdown on demand really does not um, cost much in terms of power losses. So, so you switch off the wind turbine, you let the migratory birds go, and after that, you switch on. So there are, there are tools, there are processes uh, that can be used to make the energy sector more sustainable. And more to that, um, Tarin um, alluded to the fact that um, uh, some of the experts, some of the uh, you know EIA experts that we have in the continent, do not have the capacity, do not have the you know required capacity to really uh, through think through the EIAs when they are developing the reports. So what Bad Life has done um, is to develop, you know. Um, what we call guidelines or standards. For example, if you did, if you wanted to do an EIA for a certain project, then these are some of the considerations that you have to, to look into. And with these tools, with these standards, then we hope the quality of EIA reports is better. And when the, the EIA report is implemented, we expect you know low and fewer conflict between energy infrastructure and birds. Sorry, Alex, one question there. You mentioned, sorry, what was it, EIA reports? What, what is that exactly? Well, uh, EIA reports are environmental impact assessment reports. Of course. Of course. Yeah. So, uh, so these reports, um, I mean, helps the developer, helps the policymakers, the decision makers uh, to see, okay, here we have a project but we have problems. This project is likely to have an impact on birds and other wildlife. But what are the mitigation measures that can be built in, in the project such that, you know, we have lesser, fewer, or no conflicts with the with, with biodiversity, with the birds, for example. So that's the essence of the EIA. And in most cases, um, a lot of energy pro projects we require the project proponent to undertake the EIA. So that is where bad lives comes in. You have an EIA to do, uh, the birds are at stake. So these are the items in the EIA you ought to consider to have, you know, good quality EIA and EIA that considers birds is, is one of the factors that are likely to be affected by the project and the possible mitigation measures that you can build in your project. Thank you. Okay, so Paul, now over to you. How is Power Africa addressing uh, some of these conservation, these, these challenges, this conflict between man and bird? Sorry, Jack, I think that was meant for me. Oh, apologies. Sorry, Taryn, over to you. No problem. Case. Apologies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no problem. So, so we looked at all these challenges that, that we have and uh, we understand that the biggest problem is retrofitting. So to go back after a, a line has been developed and the towers have been put in place, and now all of a sudden you've got massive outages and problems. So it's really hitting the utilities in the pocket. So the best place to start is to really go to the utilities. And Endangered Wildlife Trust assisted us um, on a number of projects in Southern Africa and East Africa. And they calculated that approximately a utility in these regions is losing about $100 million a year through revenue loss, damage to infrastructure and repairs of infrastructure. So, so, so it really is quite significant how these utilities are being affected. And that's not to say where well, you've got NGOs, you've got people actually um, negatively, providing negative publicity about the utility because of them killing birds 
or any wildlife. So we really looked at it from that perspective and we decided that it would be a good initiative to go and help the utilities to overcome these burdens. And the pro approach we took in Southern Africa and East Africa was basically to promote an awareness of wildlife and energy interactions. And through doing this, try and promote a wildlife incident management system into utilities in different shapes and forms and uh, develop tools so, so the utilities could use these tools so that they could better manage it. So in an ideal world, before you develop, you will make sure that you do an AV for the impact assessment and make sure that where you put these lines and these towers are the best kinds of lines, the best kinds of towers, have the best mechanisms on them to avoid any kind of conflict with wildlife or with birds. So I say wildlife or birds, but actually birds are included in wildlife. And when we refer to wildlife here, yeah, we're really referring mostly to birds. So your biggest impact in wildlife is birds. However, we do have impact with other things, such as in the Kruger Park of South Africa, there were incidences where giraffes got caught in the lines because the lines were too short. So, so we can't negate the fact that other wildlife also gets affected. So, so we put it under this banner of, of wildlife and energy. But as I said, you know, largely it does, it, it does relate to birds. One of the things that we did in East Africa, we developed a mainstreaming and wildlife incident management into utilities in East Africa, and that was launched a few months ago. It's a handbook that we launched that utilities can actually use and say, oh, this kind of tower would be better to be used and hand it to the, owner, uh, to the engineer and say, these are the kinds of towers we would like to use, and this is what is recommended. For example, those are the kinds of things that are in there. Or, you know, you're getting pollution on transformers. Pollution is where your birds are defecating. It actually causes the transformers to erode or corrode. And, um, you know, what, what infrastructure do you need to put up? Do you need to put a shield over your, your insulator so that it can be, be protected? So all of these mechanisms are in these manuals. And we're actually going to be launching one for Southern Africa very soon, within the next few weeks. We're going to launch one of these manuals so that the utilities in Southern Africa can also have a manual. But on top of that, we've done a lot of training um, in East Africa with uh, Ken Power and Tetraco and KPLT. Um, we did quite a bit of field investigation there and training and awareness and identified some of the problems these utilities are having as a result of wildlife and energy inter interaction. There was also some training done in Ethiopia, but unfortunately nothing moved further than that because of COVID. In Southern Africa, we, we really embedded ourselves in EDM, which is the Energy Utility in Mozambique. And what we did is we went out there and we did a readiness assessment and we checked to see, you know, what is needed in Mozambique, where are the most conflicts happening. And we had crazy things like monkeys getting electrocuted and pythons getting electrocuted and large numbers of birds. And we had thousands of crows settling in a substation that um, were roosting there and damaging all the infrastructure. So we, EWT found a way, if you used a flashing light, that it would discourage the crows from, from roosting inside the substation. So, so there were lots of things like that. And then what we did is we trained the whole utility. We developed a handbook for EDM specifically to implement an in, uh, uh, incident management system. And then we supported them and provided them an electronic database system and helped show them how to manage it so that they can use this information to know where best to put their lines, what needs to be retrofitted, where it needs to be retrofitted. And then one last initiative that we did is we worked with Eskom in South Africa, where we evaluated all their protected areas. And um, we basically looked at all the protected areas and we brought it down to 10 protected areas in each province and looked at those areas where they had the highest density of energy infrastructure. 
And then we evaluated it to see how friendly is this infrastructure and what needs to be done in the future. And uh, Eskom really appreciated the support. And any partners that we've actually had within the sector, any of the utilities have really, really embraced change in their ways because they see how much money it's costing them. And if we are moving to this revolutionizing Africa with energy and industrializing it, you know, we can't think of industrializing without knowing that if we don't do something, we are going to lose species. So we've got to bring the two together. We've got to satisfy the economics while we're trying to save the birds. So, so yes, that, that would really be, you know, all the initiatives that we've been working on. And this is the cusp of it. As I said, there's, there's only a few utilities. We've got many, many utilities in Africa. And really, for Africa to be one, one in this energy pool that we are trying to do, we're actually trying to, to energize the whole of Africa through the different power pools. If we want to do that, all the energy utilities will have to come on board and adopt these measures so that we can conserve wildlife and save utilities money at the end of the day. Over to you, Jack. Thank you. No, thank you, Taryn. Okay, I think that leads me nicely on to our next question. And I'd like to hear from all of you on this one. So, BirdLife and Power Africa are now collaborating as partners. So what does this mean going forward? Starting with you, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is great. Uh, this partnership and collaboration uh, will help mainly in streamlining birds migration challenges, as uh, we have already discussed. And um, this will also help uh, Power Africa and, and uh, bad life to come up jointly with mitigation considerations, especially when it comes to issues of planning, construction of power infrastructure and the like. Uh, besides that, uh, this partnership will enhance issues on resource, resource, resource mobilization. And I think we have seen that one of the challenges is lack of adequate resources in terms of assisting in capacity building and if this is done jointly, it can help to address the current challenges uh, uh, in the power sector. Thank you. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Jack. Um, yeah, uh, actually, Bad Life glad gladly welcomes the new partnership with Power Africa. Uh, we believe that uh, Power Africa is a unique and a very important stakeholder in the energy sector development in Africa. Uh, they have an ambitious and noble plans of connecting millions to electricity in the continent. Um, and uh, as, as, as you have heard, Jack, is that uh, Power Africa is uh, actually is conscious that uh, energy sector needs to be sustainable. Uh, on the other hand, Bad Life aspires to see a sector that is truly sustainable and using some of the most innovative approaches to achieve that. And um, uh, as you've heard, uh, Power Africa is, is already doing a lot of positive things. Um, the, the, the landscape is, is huge and because you, have, you are talking about, um, if, if, about you know, 54 uh, utilities in Africa. So, um, it is, is a huge challenge, uh, uh, you know, building the capacity, making everybody aware about the importance of having, you know, bad safe power lines, for example. So this collaboration uh, is, is really uh, very important. And in the final analysis, um, we hope that this collaboration will, the most, most importantly, help to prevent injuries and wildlife mortality, mortality as you had, reduce, uh, reduce power and physical and business losses within utilities, very important, build credibility to electric power utilities and developers. Uh, we hope that the partnership is going to build trust and public confidence in power projects. We also hope that um, a a power will be produced and transmitted and distributed sustainably. And also we hope the partnership will help to reduce potential conflicts within communities and other stakeholders. And 
very important is that uh, we hope this partnership will help in achieving some of the power related, uh, you know, sustainable development goals. And, and therefore, uh, if you look at uh, all those potential benefits, it will be actually a win-win for energy sector and nature conservation sector. And uh, we value this partnership. It has just started, but I'm hoping that uh, we, will do, we are going to do more apart from celebrating the World Migratory Bad Day with Power Africa. Thank you. Sorry, you, you may actually have answered some of this in your previous, uh, previous response. Anything to add? No, I don't think so. I think that uh, it's been adequately covered by Paul and by Alex. Thank you, Jay. Fantastic. Okay. And finally, as we're celebrating uh, World Migratory Bird Day, so we're talking, of course, well, we have been talking today about potentially human development and, uh, and conservation. What excites you all about you know, the next five to 10 years, hopefully with you know, the growth of your collaboration and where could we hope to be uh, over the next decade or so? Starting with you, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we have discussed quite a number of issues. And um, what I like most is that um, if, we, if, we, if we embrace the issues of compliance, because I believe that uh, without well thought, for example, strategic and developmental assessment frameworks that are maybe aligned with the relevant national policies or plans and programs, it may be difficult to achieve sustainable outcomes in linear infrastructure development. That is key uh, to ensure that uh, at least what we are doing at national level uh, with various stakeholders, uh, uh, compliance aspects are, are, are well articulated as we try to move on with this aspect of ensuring that uh, everything is done to, to enhance uh, our sustainable outcomes uh, are moving forward. Thank you, Alex, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Jack. Um, in the next 10 years, um, I hope to see a major shift, um, especially in the way business is conducted within the various stakeholders. The, uh, the, the business of utilities, as we speak, is to provide power. But I would like to see a transition where the utilities, for example, say their business is to pro provide power in a sustainable way. So we connect people, but how do we uh, create, you know, bigger, more footprint environment environmentally? So, so this shift is, is very important. Of course, uh, Africa is growing in many ways, and um, we have uh, ex we are experiencing a lot of competition on the available natural resources and uh, energy sector is such an important sector. So I would like to see this shift. When we talk about we have connected so much people to electricity, what amount of environmental benefits did we acquire in the process? Did we avoid collisions? Did we avoid electrocutions? Did we have a um, more stable power supply within communities and basically how does the sector can the sector also support you know conservation of nature conservation of more birds you know a, i mean a, a putting some little resources to also address other threats that for example birds are facing and this way i think will be more progressive thank you finally terry over to you Thank you, Jack. You know, there's many problems and there's, there's many ways we can potentially solve them. But for me, is definitely to see this industrialized Africa that has been done in terms of saving species. Because at the end of the day, we want to have wildlife and we want to have birds for our present and our future generations. And so we want to develop sustainably. And for me, one of the biggest ways we could do it would be, let's say, the, the place that can make the most impact is who holds the purse strings. 
So if we look at the financiers, I really believe that it should start with the financiers for them to be more stringent in terms of the environmental impact assessments and environmental social impact assessments. They approve for development before they finance a project. Because if we have pressure from the financiers, then it will trickle down to make sure that whoever develops the energy infrastructure is doing it in line with best practice. And best practice is developed by the IFC and very much by BirdLife. In South Africa, we use BirdLife guidelines. So for me, that would be the biggest place to make a big impact at the quickest amount of time, would be to get the financiers to make the biggest impact for us. And then the second thing is to get all utilities on board, making sure that whatever infrastructure they have, they retrofit and fix it so that we stop this damage towards wildlife and uh, wildlife and birds. And, and uh, you know, I know it's not ideal because it's all got to do with how much money a utility has and if they've got enough finance to, to sort all these things out. But in an ideal world, it would be wonderful to have all the utilities on board and any energy infrastructure being developed, such as for generation, is all done um, in the most sustainable manner. Thanks. Right, well, thank you all for your time. Sorry, everyone listening. Just um, after I pressed the uh, press pause there, press stop there on the recording. Alex just wanted to add a few things about the uh, old microchip data. Yeah, Alex. yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Jack. Um, I mean, uh, this is a special moment, uh, especially tomorrow, which is Saturday the fourteenth. Uh, is a special moment for nature lovers. Um, because we'll be celebrating the World Migratory Bird Day. The World Migratory Bird Day is celebrated ev uh, twice every year, and uh, it is usually, it happens that we to basically coincide with um, when birds are making those, uh, you know, epic journeys moving from north to south or from south to north. Uh, and, and what I can say, actually is that uh, migratory birds are our natural shared global ambassadors and we should as humans exert all the necessary effort to make their passage areas resting and feeding areas safe after all they have used these migratory corridors as far as humans can remember so let us cherish them uh, they connect us in some of the most extraordinary ways. Um, they are beautiful and magnificent. Migration itself is actually a natural spectacle that nature has given to us for free. This generation should consciously and jealously protect it to bequeath it to our future generations. You can imagine a bird migrating all the way from Dushanbe to Nairobi. How is that? How do you want to lose that? So I want to call you Jack, Power Africa, and everyone else to really celebrate. Go out there and watch birds. Be happy about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Alex.